Uh, I'm Tana Asi Coates. I'm a national correspondent uh, for The Atlantic. And um, <clears throat> I don't know how to put this. I, I'll, I'll put it like this. I've had the unfortunate. Um, all right. Um, I've had the unfortunate uh, privilege of uh, being in conversation with uh, Lucia uh, r repeatedly uh, since the passing of, of her son, Jordan Davis. And I believe this is the second time I'm going to be in conversation with Ron. Uh, I, I say it's unfortunate due to the circumstance, uh, but, but it's quite an honor uh, in, in another respect because um, I'm always amazed. I, I grew up um, outside of the church. And, and I'm always amazed uh, how uh, people are able to transform themselves uh, in the events of you know, tragedy and, and passing. And so I, I just want to start there. You know, we, we've had this conversation before, me and you, but I, I just, could, can you just speak to how, um, you see, how, how Jordan's passing transformed your life? Like what trajectory you were on before and where you are now? Um, needless to say, my life has been completely changed overnight. Um, in raising Jordan, you know, I was dealing with my second bout of breast cancer, and so we believed it was best to send Jordan to his father um, while I healed and went through treatments. But then it was also time for him to continue the raising for Jordan. Uh, Jordan was 16 at that time, and uh, Ron needed to, tr to transition him into manhood, so to speak. Um, you know, it was always, you know, Jordan always coming home to visit for the holidays. And, and you know, I would always be excited uh, with him coming back home to Atlanta where he was raised. Uh, and just completely overnight within a 24-hour span of time, it was just, just been completely surreal. Um, there's still days I wake up and I say, did this really happen? No, this didn't really, really happen. And then, of course, the reality continues to sink in. Um, I was a flight attendant for 30 years. And I would only fly on the weekend so I could stay home during the week with Jordan and homeschool him. And so, you know, we had a really, really good life. Um, you know, Ron and I were both extremely involved in the raising of him, even though we had divorced and Ron had moved to Florida. You know, as he says in the film, we made it work. Jordan was first for us. Um, I expected that I would still be, you know, a flight attendant, you know, until I retired once Jordan went to live with Ron. But since um, his murder, I have become a person I never imagined in my life that I would be. Um, the very things that I was trying to teach Jordan to be as a protector of his friends and uh, champion, championing, championing for people and friends that he had that, you know, um, were downtrodden or the underdogs, uh, caring about people that had less than he had or were less fortunate than he was, um, and, and trying to, 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 to raise him to be compassionate and have a sense of humanity for people. I, the very things I used to say to him all the time is that, you know, Jordan would say, Mom, who do, who do you see me as? Who do you think I'm going to be when I get older? And I would say, Jordan, you know, you have such a gift of bringing people together, and you, you're very intuitive, you're very wise, and, you know, I always say our house was like a little mini United Nations, you know, Jordan had friends of every faith and religious denomination, and they would all come because he was kind of like the center and the focus. And I used to say, I see you as someone bringing people together. I see you as a champion for the people, as an organizer. You're, you're going to be someone that, that, that works among people, you know, creating change. And it's just... I, I still say that it's surreal because now I'm walking out that very legacy that I was speaking into my child. And it's just very, it's very, very hard because we didn't get to see him be. We didn't get to see him become everything that God 
had ordained him to be. But in that, you know, the work that Rod and I have taken on is that we will continue to champion and to be that very thing that we were trying to teach Jordan to be. And we hope that through this film and through our work, that we will open people's eyes and they'll really begin to see what's happening in the country. Right. Can, uh, you know, one of the things that's happened is, um, I mean, you guys have become full-fledged activists. Yeah. How did that transformation take place for you guys? When, when did it, you know, dawn on you, okay, I, I got I to gotta do something? <laughs> well, you know, when you, I don't know if, you know, how many people in the audience have lost loved ones, but especially when you lose a child, and you're on the couch or your bed, and, and you get that phone call, and um, that is the worst day, the worst minute, the worst hour of your life. And I got the phone calls. I, I was at work, and I just got a call from Jordan's best friend's mother, Leland Brunson's mother. And she said Jordan's been shot. So I had to take that drive to the hospital. I don't know if he was dead or alive. And that's, you know, you're crying and you're wiping your tears away and you're driving. You hope you don't hit anybody and hurt anybody else because you're not really paying attention. You're just thinking about your child. And you get to the hospital and they said they had no record of it. And it takes them a whole hour. Mm -hmm. And I sat there worrying whether that was my child or not and screaming at people. And then finally, I told uh, the administrator that um, I have a cell phone, I have a picture of Jordan on my phone. If you have anybody back there in the emergency room, look at this picture and tell me. And when she took the picture and brought, brought it back, she came back with a chaplain, the doctor, and two policemen. And all I remember is the doctor saying, Mr. Davis, uh, I'm sorry I couldn't revive. And, and I don't know what he said after that. A scream just welled up in me and must have come out of me in such a way that this big six foot five, 260 pound policeman, he just started crying. You know, he just went in the bathroom and got some tissues. The chaplain, she started crying. And now I have to drive home and I have to tell my wife, who doesn't know anything that's going on, that Jordan has been shot and killed. Then I have to get on the phone and tell Jordan's mother that her son has been shot and killed. And as I was sitting in the car when I got home to tell these two individuals this terrible, terrible, terrible message, I, I noticed that everything in my neighborhood was quiet. I couldn't hear a thing. It was almost like I had gone deaf. And I sat in the car probably around 20 minutes because I just couldn't move and get out the car and have to deal with this, this responsibility of telling other people, your family members, that you had lost a loved one, which is going to affect the whole families. Uh, but I did that. And when I think about Michael Dunn, how callous he was with my son's life, you're looking at a man that he didn't even remember what Jordan looked like. When they showed him another picture of Jordan, they asked, who, do he know who this guy is? And he said, no, he didn't know who Jordan Davis was. At the end of that film, you saw he even hesitated when he tried to remember who Jordan Davis' name was. And during the trial, as parents, you have to navigate this horrible judicial system where everything is leaning toward the killer of your son, whereas you couldn't even called Jordan a victim in court. They didn't allow, even though he had three bullets in his chest, coughing on his own blood, choking to death, and dying in the arms of his loved ones, but he wasn't a victim. The judge told us to not show too much emotion in court, otherwise he'd have to throw us out of court. That's why you see these pictures of me and Lucy looking pretty stoic. And I just had to train my eye behind the judge's head every time I heard those lies about Jordan having a gun. And I looked at the great seal of Florida. And at the bottom it said, in God we trust. And I kept saying to myself, in God we trust, in God we trust. And I said that over and over and over again. Till this day, I always think about that I told Jordan during the school week that he had to be home at 1030. And you know teenagers, they take it to the limit. At 1029, I hear the keys in the door. 
two and a half years later, if I'm in my easy chair, it's just something that comes over me, and I lean, and I look toward the front door, listening out for Jordan's keys. And it never comes in the door anymore. And I look at my watch, and it's 1029. He had a watch that he loved to have on. And when he got this big watch, it always went off at 448 p.m. And I said, Jordan, why don't you take the alarm off? You know, you, you know. He said, I don't feel like reading the directions, Dad. I'll just leave it on and I'll deal with 448 p.m. I said, that's ridiculous. You know, 448, the thing just goes off if I'm in the kitchen or whatever. So when Jordan died, I went in his room, and there was that watch, and it went off, and it was at 448. And I said to myself, that's Jordan talking to me. That's Jordan talking to me. So I took it upstairs, and every single day, at 448, that watch goes off, and I feel Jordan in my heart. I feel him in my heart. Michael Dunn, he says one thing in this film that always gets to me. He says, and where are their fathers? I just want to let him know Jordan Davis' father is right here standing tall. <laughs> Well, you know, this idea of fatherhood has, you know, become sort of a trope, um, and the idea that, you know, all the problems um, in the African American community can be blamed that way. And one of the, you know, sad things that we observe is uh, Trayvon Martin had a. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. All right. Um, this this idea of, of blaming the absence of fathers um, has become sort of a trope uh, in the African American community, or for observers of the African American community, where everything that, you know, everything that ails of the black community, you say, you know, where are the fathers, where are the fathers? And, and I think one of the sad things that, you know, we observe about the events over the past few years is that Trayvon Martin had a father. Jordan Davis had a father. Michael Brown had two fathers. Tamir Rice ha had a father. Mm -hmm. And it just wasn't enough to save any of them. Um, one of the things that, you know, we've talked about in private conversation that I would like you guys to talk about here is, um, is almost like a, a fraternity or sorority, I guess I should, should call it both, fraternity and sorority, <laughs> of families who've lost children in, in, in this kind of way that's formed. What, what are the conversations like? It's, <laughs> they're the conversations that, you know. Did no Sabrina one, like call you right away or was? Sabrina Fulton and I have become friends. Um, Sabrina Fulton is Trayvon Martin's mother. Trayvon's mother. mother. Doesn't know. Yes, and I actually have, you know, we've spoken very, very candidly. I've spent a good amount of time with her and um, I applaud her, and I've told this, I've said this to her many times, I applaud you, one, as a black woman, as a black mother, because I can stand because you first stood. With such grace and dignity, she stood, continues to stand in light of not ever having received any justice for her child, with the killer still meandering around the country freely. And so those are the kinds of things that um, the mothers, I have met the mothers of um, all of the high profile cases, we've all come together uh, actually this um, last month, and it's extremely painful because when I look into the eyes of another mother, I know exactly what she's feeling and she's thinking, because we're all in it. And it's never anything that we get rid of. Every single day, we're faced with not having our children and not having our children because of the implicit biases of African, I mean, uh, towards African Americans that are being played out through the explicit gun violence in this country. And we don't, you know, what can we say to one another? What can we say to one another? All we do is cry. Because what else is there left for us to do but cry? And then after we cry, we pull ourselves together and we go back out on the streets and we fight. Because if we don't fight for our communities, there's nobody else out here fighting for us. 
There's no one else out here fighting for our boys. So we gather ourselves with our pain, and we gather ourselves with our memories, and we go back out, and we scream loudly and clearly, hear us, see us. And we do this every single day. This is for the rest of our lives. And the fact that we have to do this is just so unbelievable that today, in this day and age, in this society, that we have to live like this. We have to try to champion for our people every single day so that no other mother has to feel no other father has to feel what we feel and what we're going through. We have this circle of fathers set up by Tracy Martin. And uh, my task is when we have these situations like we had Walter Scott in North Charleston, South Carolina, I go and I call him and I welcome him to a club that nobody wants to be a member of. I did the same thing to Mike Brown. I went up to Ferguson and did the same thing and welcomed him into the club. August 15th, we're going to have another annual Circle of Fathers. But a lot of things that we do, such as we make decisions that we want the fathers to get out front because a lot of times they are marginalized. A lot of times we see the protests and we see the fine women out there protesting and we said, you know, get some fathers out there. I know I stand up for my son. And this day and age where we have white supremacy, I like to tell all these fathers, when you speak to the media, make sure you separate, because there's a difference between white Americans and white supremacy. There's a hell of a difference. White supremacy, they want the good old days that was good for them, but wasn't so good for us. They want the trees to be hung with bodies hanging from the trees called strange fruit. They want the good old days where the laws were all in their favor and if you were black in America, you had no rights way back when, when you were three-fifths of a human being. That's the good old days for some people. And I charge the white Americans in this country to say enough is enough and don't let the white supremacists rule this country. You have to take up and fight with us as people of color, as black Americans, as Latin Americans. You have to help us and talk to your people, people that we can't touch, among your friends at church, among your friends at work, where when there's no black people around, where are the conversations? You have to go out and help us make this truly America the beautiful, because right now it's not beautiful. You have to look at Charleston, those nine people that gave their lives for a cause, that they believed in Christ and they believed in, in the Bible, and they didn't take up arms against an individual that shot nine people dead and still America yawns. Newtown, 20 little kids, elementary school, the, the purest time in our lives, six, seven, eight years old, to be shot down and murdered, shot with an assault rifle. You can't even put the bodies back together. And America yawned. Well, you know, America, we have to stop yawning. We have to get up off our asses and say, enough is enough. So I'm, I'm not going to do what I did last time we had this conversation, where I dominate and ask all the questions. I want to make sure I open up uh, to the audience uh, for a few questions. Why don't we start way in the back right here? Hello, my name is Devlin Watkins. I work for the Aspen Institute. Ron and I had the pleasure of speaking earlier in the week. Um, but first, my condolences. Thank you. Um, as a father of two young black sons, I had those conversations. I have to tell my eldest son, keep your hands out of your pockets. Don't put a hoodie on. Watch what you say. Look him in the face and be direct. You know, be aware of your surroundings. I had those conversations. But the conversation I can't have is how do I prepare my son or sons to deal with a fear that they don't understand, that they don't understand why people are afraid of them. How do I prepare them to walk out? Because I can only protect them when they're in my home, but when they're outside, how do I protect them from a fear that they don't understand? 
I truly don't believe that there is a fear. I think it's a cop out. When people do things wrong, whether you be law enforcement or a citizen, and you shoot and kill, and it's undeserved because it's a, like Michael Dunn, a decision you made. The concealed weapon classes, they tell you, say five words when the police come. I fear for my life. They all say that over and over. It's memorized. So there's not a real fear. How can you fear a young kid out having a good time playing his music loud? You have the gun. You're six foot five, 280 pounds. But you said you fear for your life. Would you roll down the window and ask somebody, are you talking to me if you feared for your life? You didn't fear for your life. So I, I, don't, I don't believe when people say that white Americans fear black Americans. I think that there are situations that you may fear because you may be in an elevator with somebody that might look notorious, or you may be out in a dark place and you may not recognize the neighborhood. You may have a justified fear. But I don't think on a day-to-day -day basis, when you're at your coffee shop and at your store, I think in this day and age, many of us are around African Americans, many of us are around, and we go through life with each other by now. And I don't think we have a real fear of each other. I think it's a cop-out. And so tell your sons, just be the man that they can be, go to school, get a great education, and just be enlightened what's happening today. And I think it's really important that, you know, of course we know that we have to have a, second, a different kind of set of uh, discussions with our children than white America. Continue to have those discussions. It's imperative that you do, but it's also important to teach them to walk with their heads held high. Mm. Be who they are. Do not diminish themselves as a, as, a, as a black male in this country. To walk in faith and knowing that they are valuable, they have value, they have merit, and do not be afraid. Right. Any other questions? Down here. Thank you. It is such a privilege to uh, be able to listen to you both speak. Um, I guess I'm going I'm to ask you a question about the film. I thought it was beautifully done. Uh, from your perspective, did it convey the messages that you wanted to convey? Anything you would have liked to have seen change? Um, it has, the film has done exactly what we wanted it to do. We wanted it to begin opening discussions. We wanted it to uh, kind of prick that that conscience that I talked about in the film. We want people to begin thinking about the implicit biases, hidden biases that maybe they don't know that they have. If we can begin getting people to think about those kinds of things, taking those discussions, that, that introspective really digging deep, trying to figure out what do I really think about black men? What do I really think about minorities in this community? And am I willing to open the discussion, take it in the venues and the areas where people are afraid to talk about it? And beyond that, am I willing to take some responsibility towards changing the tide of the gun violence and the perceptions of minorities in this country? Because everything that happens to us, it is a trickle-down theory. It's like everything, you throw a stone in water in a pond, and it just trickles out. So whatever happens to us as a race of people in this country dynamically affects everyone in the country. And that's what we want you to understand and see, that the destruction of a whole race of people in this country is not what this country is supposed to be founded and based upon. We say, in God we trust. Then look in your conscience, look in your heart. The heart of man has to be changed one individual at a time. Changing the conscience is not only here, it's here. You have to change the heart of man and get them to understand that we are all dynamically connected. And what happens to me eventually is an extension of what happens to you. The gun violence in this country has gone outside of the urban community. So now no one can sit here and say, oh, it's only happening to them. Sandy Hook, Aurora, Virginia Tech, you know, Washington at the Navy Yard. It is 
everywhere. And so we have to open these discussions, but not only that, we should be pounding down the doors of our legislators and our civic leaders and saying, why are you allowing these kinds of heinous laws to be passed in the country that continue to systemically destroy human beings and our communities? We put you in office to protect and care about our welfare, and you're not doing so. And so if you are refusing to be accountable to our safety and sanctity and preservation of human life, we will remove you. And those are the kinds of things that we have to do. It's not enough to pray about it and to talk about it behind closed doors. We have to act. We have to act. And I say shame on anyone in this country that turns a blind eye to what's happening. Shame on you. Because as human beings, as Americans, we're a nation of immigrants. We've all migrated here from other places to live in the land of the free, the home of the brave. And the fact that there's a whole sector of society that can has to walk around in fear, that's not what we're supposed to be living like in this country. So I, we want to challenge you. We want to challenge you to go beyond what you see here tonight and don't just talk about it. Figure out how in some way, shape, or form you can begin to change the tide of gun violence in this country. I had um, an experience right here in, in uh, Aspen and I'll never forget it. It touched my heart so much. It was an older gentleman. And I'm old too, but it was an older gentleman. And uh, he was with his wife and he was walking on the trail out here and he saw my Jordan Davis shirt and he hollered out. He says, oh, Jordan Davis, did he play basketball? <laughs> and his wife looked at him, what are, you, what, are you, what are you talking about? What are you? And so she chastised my guest. And so then I spoke today over at the, the other room and uh, this morning, and that same man, after I spoke, he came up to me, and he had tears in his eyes. Mm. And he said, you know, I'm from an older generation, mm. and I don't understand. And when my wife told me about what happened to your son, mm. it broke my heart. Oof. And I canceled my lunch appointments and everything to come and see you and to let you know that it's just unforgivable what I said. I said, I forgive you. He said, it's unforgivable. I said, it can be forgiven because at least you came back to me and told me. And he said, I'm so sorry for your loss, Mr. Davis. I thank you for what you're doing and for what you came up here. He says, I'm going to pull up your website. He said, and, and I want to just do anything I can for what your cause is. And, I saw, and he hugged me and I hugged him. And I've gotten that experience in Aspen, Colorado. I want to thank you all so much for treating us the way you've been treating us since we've been in Aspen. It's our first time. And it's been a wonderful experience for us. And I just want to thank you right here and now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that, um, that seems like a fine note to end on. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Uh, the film is great. Tell everybody about it.